Okay, so let's quickly review. Newton's first law. Newton's first law has a long version, which you learned in seventh grade. Objects in motion remain in motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an outside force. Object at rest remain at rest unless an outside force acts on them, right? We can say that a whole lot easier. We can just say that if there's no external force on an object, it cannot accelerate. All that stuff about changing states of motion, that's just acceleration. So Newton's first law says, if you don't have any unbalanced forces, you can't accelerate. That means you can't speed up, you can't slow down, you can't change direction. It does not mean you have to be stopped necessarily, right? If something's stopped and not moving, the net force is zero. But if a skydiver is falling through the air and they've reached their terminal velocity, the net force is also zero. The force down on them due to gravity and the force up on them are equal. The net force is zero. Does that mean they're stopped? No, they're falling at 140 miles an hour. They're just not speeding up or slowing down, right? So first one, if there's no net force, object cannot accelerate. Second one says, if there is a net force, the object will accelerate, okay? So that looks like this. An external force, an unbalanced external force, causes a mass to accelerate. A couple of notes about this. The acceleration is proportional to the unbalanced force. So if you double the unbalanced force, you'll double the acceleration, okay? Think about this, if the mass was constant, if you made this number twice as big, what would happen to that number? You get twice as big, right? So it's proportional. The unbalanced force is proportional to the acceleration. Also, the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. Making the mass bigger makes the acceleration smaller. You know this when you get stuck behind a truck on the road, right? And the light turns red, it's got a big mass, it's gonna have a small acceleration. Think about it like this. If this number stayed the same, if you made this number two times bigger, what's gonna happen to that number so the product is the same? That number's two times bigger, this one's gotta be half as big, or two times smaller, right? So the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. And, of course, we measure force in newtons. That's Newton's second law. Newton's third law said forces come in pairs. That's it. If I push on the wall, the wall pushes back on me. They're the same size force. If a bus hits a bug, or the bug hits the bus, the forces are the same size. If the earth pulls down on me, I pull up on the earth. If the sun pulls on the earth, the earth pulls on the sun. Those forces are always equal in size and opposite in direction. Don't get confused though. Just because the forces are the same size doesn't mean the effects of them are the same, right? I mean, if we drop you out of a plane, the earth's gonna pull you down and you're gonna pull the earth up. But your mass is pretty tiny, so you're gonna get pulled down pretty darn fast and the earth's not gonna move a whole lot, right? There's still a force pulling up on the earth, it's just not very big. 150 pounds of force pulling up on the earth is not gonna move this big ball. 150 pounds of force pulling on you is gonna cause you to accelerate pretty fast. All right, that was Newton's three laws. Then we added the force of gravity. So weight is the force of gravity, right? And we learned how to calculate it. So if you wanna calculate the weight of something, you just take M, the mass, times G. So that was the second lesson. Right? So if you know the mass, you know the weight. The weight is the force of gravity pulling down. If we take you to outer space and we drop you off, does your mass change? Does your weight change? Yes, if there's no gravity, you have no weight. It doesn't mean there's no you. It just means there's no force on you because there's nothing around to pull on you, right? All right. Some other forces, you know the weight is the force of gravity. The normal force is the force exerted by surfaces. So what's pushing up on your computer right now? Gravity's pulling down, what's pushing up? The table, what force do we call that? Normal force is a force exerted by solid surfaces. We call it normal because in mathematics, normal means perpendicular. So a line that is normal to a line is perpendicular. So we call it the normal force because it's always perpendicular to the surface. 
If the surface is this way, the force it exerts is that way, perpendicular. So, what's the force? Uh, what force does the row exert on a car? A normal force. The floor on me, normal force. Your seat on you, a normal force. Solid surfaces exert perpendicular forces on the objects. They're called normal forces. Tensions are exerted by things like cables and ropes and strings. And this is a little bit of a side. But another force we're not going to look at, tensions are forces that tend to pull molecules apart. So if you have a string and you try to pull it apart, the molecules are like hanging on to each other, right? That's a tension force. The force that tends to shove things together, we call a compression force. And there are entire courses in college about forces and analyzing them. When you build a bridge, you gotta know which way the force is going. If the force tends to push things together, that's a compressive force, and you better build that part out of concrete. If the force tends to pull two things apart, that's a tension force, and you better make steel cables or something for that. If you try to put a heavy load on top of a steel cable, it would just crush, right? It would bend and bow and break, or not break, but just collapse. Steel cables are not good for compression forces, but concrete's awesome. In fact, concrete gets stronger the more force you apply to it. It actually increases its strength. But concrete's useless for tension. If you try to pull on something that's made out of concrete, it'll just crumble apart. Concrete use. So compression forces are forces which tend to force things together. We're not going to look at them. They tend, I mean, right now they kind of fall under normal forces, right? The, the road pushes up on the car, the car pushes down the road, the car tends to compress the road, so it's a compressive force. But, um, tensions are the forces exerted by things that are flexible. So in general, you can, they're good at withstanding being pulled apart, but they're terrible at withstanding being pushed together. They bend and flex and bow. Drag forces are the forces that um, you encounter, the oppositional forces, when you're moving in a fluid. Normally, when you are walking down the street, you are not too worried about the drag forces, although if there's a hefty headwind, you can definitely feel it, right? Ever try to ride your bicycle into a headwind? It's a lot of work. So drag forces are anytime you move through a fluid, they oppose your motion, okay? So water, air are the most common fluids you might be moving through, but anything else, um, too, okay? So if somebody puts you in a big bucket of oil and you gotta run around, that's a drag force. And then friction forces are the forces you get when two surfaces move relative to each other, okay? And that's what we're gonna look at today. All right, so that's a review of the forces. So I think I covered most of the things in that warm up, except, ha uh -huh, I forgot. What's the capital of Malawi? You got that one right? How the heck did you know that? What? Oh, I didn't want you to know the capital of Malawi. I just wanted you to know that it wasn't Moscow, Paris, or London, right? Did anybody know what a dime was? No. But you got that one right. Because I said, which of these is not a unit of force? And you guys all knew kilograms is not a unit of force. So you weren't, I wasn't trying to see if you knew what a dime was. I was trying to see if you knew that a kilogram wasn't a unit of force. See that? That's a key trick to us. Sometimes the question isn't about what the question looks like it's about. I'm not trying to see if you know the capital of remote African countries. I'm trying to see if you know major world centers and know they're not in Africa. Right? See the difference? SAT is there. All right. Uh, so here's a paradox. If you had two rocks, 100 kilogram rocks, we're talking a rock like 220 pounds, a massive rock, and you had a 10 kilogram rock, so 20 kilogram rock. 28 pounds. Which one does gravity pull harder on? Ethan, take a guess. Gravity pulls the same on both. So you could hold one up with your right hand and the other one with your left hand and it'd take the same force to hold them up. So which one does gravity pull harder on? All right. If you drop them, which one would accelerate faster? I mean, if we work it out, the force of gravity is m times g, so that would be 98 newtons. 
10 times 9.8, 98. You do that one in my head. This one's 980 newtons. So clearly there's bigger force pulling down on here, right? And if you had a 220 pound weight and a 20 pound weight, clearly that one's heavier. So which one would fall faster if you let them both go? Well, if gravity pulls harder on this one, wouldn't it fall faster? Natalie? No. Explain yourself. What do you mean if you solve it out? So if you use that one equation we talked about, we're like... Equation equation. Give me a reason. Why would they fall at the same rate if gravity's pulling harder on this guy? So if I had a car, and it had an engine, and it could accelerate, if I made the engine twice as big, but I made the car twice as heavy, what would happen to its acceleration? Stay the same. So it has more force on it because I have a bigger engine, but what else does it have more of? Mass. It has more inertia. So the gravity does pull harder on a bigger rock, but a bigger rock also has more inertia, which opposes changes, right? Which one's harder to get going? The big rock. So it's harder to get going and it's harder to stop. So although gravity pulls harder on it, it's harder to get it going. Having twice the force on the car, but twice the mass doesn't change its acceleration, right? So if you work it out, with Natalie's equation, the acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. If you take the force, 98, and you divide it by the mass, 10, you get 9.8. Here, you have more force, but you gotta divide it by a bigger mass. There's more inertia, and so you get the same acceleration. So the reason things all fall the same rate isn't because gravity pulls on them with the same force. Gravity pulls four times harder on the croquet ball than this ball but this has four times as much inertia also, okay? And since mass and inertia are connected, having more mass means you have more force, but you also have more inertia. Now, which one's harder to stop? You wanna stick your foot under that guy or that guy? Yeah, it has less inertia, so it was easier to get going. You only needed 98 newtons to get it going, but you won't need as much force to stop it either, right? Okay, so. People think that things fall at the same rate because gravity pulls on them all the same. That's not true. Gravity pulls on more mass of objects with more force. But they also have more inertia. And those two cancel. All right? Okay, so let's get to friction. I've got a block sliding to the right. Friction acts because these two surfaces are in contact and it produces an oppositional force. Okay? We call that oppositional force friction. Friction comes about because there are actually irregularities at this surface. There's imperfections, and those imperfections and irregularities catch on each other as those two surfaces are going by each other, all right? So um, if you were to make this a little smoother, there'd be less irregularities, and you'd get a little less friction. So smooth things tend to have less friction than rough things, okay? How do you make something really slippery? Got all shy all of a sudden? A lot of ways. Name one way you would make the road slippery. Ice. Eli? Add soap. Add soap. Yes, if you sprayed soap on a desk, it would make it really slippery. Why? Soap is a molecule. It's a fatty, hydroscopic molecule that fills in all the little gaps. And if all the little gaps are filled in, the things aren't catching anymore. They're gliding on this film. Or you could wax something. Or you could put some ice down, right? Ice is slippery because it freezes very smooth. 
There's not a whole lot of imperfections there. So the roughness is what causes friction. And so two surfaces have got to be in contact for there to be friction, and they have to be moving relative to each other. Okay? Now, there's some nuances to friction, and I want to talk about them for a minute, but at the end of the thing, I'll tell you what the important thing you got to understand. Okay? So this might feel just a little overwhelming for a minute, but it'll explain a lot of cool things. So hang in there with me. So in lab, we graph the friction force and the weight. And we said the friction force is proportional to the weight. That's true for both the smooth and the rough surfaces, right? They're both proportional. Um, our math model looks something like this. Y equals m times x. We're going to rewrite that like this. On our y-axis, we have the friction force. So the friction force is going to equal, and we're going to use this Greek letter mu as the symbol for the slope. Okay? We're going to call it the coefficient of friction, this little thing. And then, of course, the weight is mg, right? So this is the exact same thing we got in lab right here. Y, the friction force, equals the slope, which we're going to call the coefficient of friction, times the weight, which is m times g. All right? So this is the Greek letter mu. We ran out of regular letters. We can't use f for friction because we got f's all over the place. What else are you going to use? So we use the Greek letter mu. Okay? It's like a u, but it's got a long tail on the front. Okay? So it's like a u with a tail on the front. Kind of, kind of go like this. So here's your line, here's your little dotty line. Remember these in elementary school? It looks something like that. Okay? It's one of the Greek letters, it's a lowercase u. We can use other Greek letters, pi, theta, delta, right? All right. Now, don't take notes on this, because I don't really, I want you to see it, I don't want you to memorize it or waste time I'm trying to commit it to memory. There's two kinds of friction. When surfaces are in motion, we have kinetic friction. Kinetic means motion, right? Like kinetic energy is energy in motion. A kid who's hyperkinetic is a kid who's just zooming around nonstop. So we have friction. So we, if something's moving, we use mu sub k, the kinetic friction constant. And if something's sitting still, we use static friction constant, mu sub x. Okay? So the reason there's two different kinds of friction is when two things are sitting still, imagine all those irregularities, they're going to sink in, right? And it's really hard to get them moving. Once you get them moving, they're kind of bouncing along on the top of each other. They don't really sink in as much, right? So you get more friction when two things are stopped, when the irregularities settle in, than when you're moving and they're bouncing along, okay? So um, if you imagine, I've got a box, so let's say I'm going to use this box right here. Pretend it's a box, okay? And let's say it has a mass of 100, its weight is 100 newtons. That's its weight, 100 newtons. So the ground pushes up with 100 newtons also. And the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.5, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.4. It's always true that static friction is bigger than kinetic. Because when you're sitting still, the imperfections settle in and it's harder to get it going. Okay? Now, why is this a less than or equal to? Well, here's why. If I put in 100 newtons times 0.5, what would you get? 100 times 0.5. 50. You guys know that. You're seeing shot. So, here's what it's saying. The force of friction will be anything up to 50. If I push with 10 newtons of force this way, it won't move. It's not enough. But what is this pushing back with? If I push with 10 this way, friction opposes it with 10. It doesn't oppose it with 50. If I push at 20, it opposes with 20. If I push with 40, it opposes with 40. If I push with 51, now I've exceeded its static friction. It'll start moving, and now it'll be a kinetic friction problem. Okay. So the reason this is less than or equal to friction, if I, if I push with 5 newtons, it doesn't push back with 50. Okay? It's always up to a limit. And then once it gets moving, 
use kinetic friction. So what that looks like on a graph, don't worry. What this just shows is what I just explained, okay? If I apply a force in newtons, the friction force will be the same that I apply. See, this is a slope of one, right? 20, 20. Whatever force I apply, friction will push back with me until I get to 50 newtons, at which time it starts moving. And once it starts moving, the friction jumps down to a smaller value of 40 newtons. No matter how much I push with, friction can only push back with 40 newtons. That's all that study, okay? So the part I want you to get from all this is when things are sitting still, you get static friction, and static friction is bigger than kinetic friction, all right? And you need to know that because you're all drivers, and your life depends on it, right? You're not quite so sure? So here's what happens. When your car is going down the road and your tires are turning, rotating, you're using static friction because here's the road and here's the tire. It goes like that. The, the, the imperfections in the tire were settling into the imperfections of the road and giving you static friction. As long as your wheel is turning, there's no relative motion between the floor or the ground and your tire. Does that make sense? When will your tire be moving relative to the ground? When you lock your brakes, right? When you skid. So which one gives you more friction? When your tire is turning or when your tire is stopped and skidding? You get more friction from the static when, it's, when, when the when the surfaces are not moving, which is when your wheel is turning, not when you're skidding. So your car, if it's built any time since 1998 or so, has probably automatic braking system, okay? Anti-lock braking system. And here's how it works. When you try to hit the brake, so try it sometime. You can go slow in your neighborhood, or you can wait till there's an icy spot and get a big parking lot. If you hit your brakes, your wheel will not stop turning it'll actually kind of just hammer back at you. You ever felt that? That is your brake computer trying to keep your wheel from locking up because we want your wheel to keep turning. So even if there's not a whole lot of friction, at least you're getting static friction of the wheel turning. As soon as the wheel stops turning and you're skidding, you actually have less force. You have less stopping force and you have less control over your steering because you're sliding. So sliding is bad because you're, you have static friction. I mean kinetic friction. When your wheel keeps turning, um, you have this friction, which is more, okay? So the idea is your computer controls your brakes so you can't ever lock up your wheels. If you have an old car, you can lock up your wheels and skid and spin out and it's a whole lot of fun until it happens in the real life on the bridge when the guy in front of you stopped. So anti-lock brakes are an example of how we use technology to make sure we always stay in the static friction zone, which is always greater force than the kinetic friction, okay? All right, so all of that until now are just kind of ideas, concepts. Here's the part we're gonna solve problems with. So let's drop this in our toolbox, okay? And if you wanna annotate it, this is the friction force, this is the coefficient of friction, and then you have the mass in G, right? This is the equation we're gonna use to solve problems with. So take a minute, to put it in your toolbox, Force due to friction is equal to mu, the Greek letter mu. We're, we're only going to solve problems when things are the, the things are sliding, slipping. So we're going to use mu sub k times mg. Now, just be careful. That's mu with a subscript k. If you get sloppy and you write mu times k times m times g. A few weeks from now, you'll be like, I got mu, but what's k? You'll think it's another variable, okay? So it's a subscript. It means the kinetic friction. All right, everybody got that? 
me a wave and you don't have a second. All right, here we go. Let's solve two problems. I'll solve one, you solve one. about when somebody is shoving it. Somebody's already given it a shove. Okay? It is just sliding across the counter. You're sitting there having your cookies after school and the milk jug just goes sliding by. Right there is where we're interested in. Okay? So what we are going to do is try to figure out its acceleration by finding the forces on it. So we're going to start by making a free body diagram. Okay? There's my milk jug right there. That's it. Free body diagrams only involve a dot showing the object. Now, what are the forces on it? There's an easy one. It's on every single one we ever do. Gravity. gravity. Which way does it go? So here's the force of gravity going down. We'll call that F sub G. Is the milk jug accelerating downwards? No. So there's something pushing up. What is it, Jaden? The normal force due to the counter, right? The counter is a solid surface. That's the normal force. What other forces are on there, Damon? Which way? Any more, Damon? This is the single most common mistake in this unit. People want to put a force on it to the right. It's moving that way. Does it have a force? Well, it needed a force to get it moving, but once it's moving, I mean, there's, the milk jug just sliding across the counter. Nobody's hands on it. There's no strings attached. It doesn't have a little rocket engine. It's just sliding across the counter. In fact, if there was no friction, if somebody greased the counter, it would keep sliding forever, right? You don't need a force to keep something moving. Inertia does that. So that's the free body diagram right there. Let's jot down what we know. What is the 4.0? It's the mass. So we know the mass is 4.0 kilograms. And I think we know the coefficient of kinetic friction. The coefficient of kinetic friction, the use of K, is 0 0.4. I think that's all we know, right? Now, you can put G equals 9.81 meters per second squared in there, but it's actually not a variable. It doesn't change. So we typically don't put it in our variable list. It's a constant. We're going to use it, but it's not ever going to change unless you go to a different planet. Um, so that's, that's what I got. All right, now, my plan. The first thing I've got to do in order to find the acceleration is I gotta find the net force, right? Before I can find the net force, I gotta find this friction force. So my first step is to find friction force. So I'm gonna find the friction force using this equation we just got, which tells us the friction force is mu sub k times m times g. And if we wanna put in our numbers, we'll get the friction force equals 0.40 the coefficient of friction has no units. So it's the slope of our line. We plot it newtons and newtons. And so the slope is rise over run, or newtons over newtons, or nothings. Okay, so there's no unit on this. Times m, which is 4.0 kilograms, times g, which is 9.81 meter per second squared. Okay, let's just kind of ballpark this. This is 10. What's 10 times 4? 40. What's four tenths of 40? Four tenths of 40. We'll take 40 divided by 10, four, and we got four tenths of 16. Close to 16. Now, since this is a little less than 10, our answer could be a little less than 16, right? So, punch in your calculator and see if you get an answer a little less than 16. Fifteen point seven. We're close, right? That's the force of friction on the milk. What if you sprayed your counter with clutch? What would that do? Yeah. 
said, fill in all those little nooks and crannies on the counter, and that milk jug would go much faster. All right, second step. Now that we know the friction force, we are going to apply Newton's law. So we are going to apply Newton's second law to our problem. You guys go to build a better workshop with your kids? Come on, admit it. No? Yeah. You guys miss build a bear? Oh, that's sad. Build a bear, you know how you go build a bear? Well, don't worry, I'll make up for it. We got build an equation. This is an idea. And when you apply it to the problem, you get to build your own equation. Isn't that cool? Plus it doesn't clutter your room with fuzzy things that hold lots of dust. So when we apply this to our problem, we're gonna get an equation. Now, we are not worried about these two forces because they cancel, right? The force going up, the force going down, they cancel each other. There's no net force there. But in the x direction, horizontally, what forces go to the right? Hmm. Ben, what force goes to the right? Andrew, sorry. Wrong one. Which force goes to the right? To the right. Trick question. What force goes to the right? There is no force to the right. So the force is to the right minus the force to the left, which is F of X. That is the net force. The net force is the unbalanced force. You get the forces to the right minus the forces to the left. That equals the mass times the acceleration. Okay? So when I apply Newton's law to this problem, I get this equation. That's where it comes from. Don't start here. Start there. That's the big idea. You apply the principle to build yourself an equation, and now we can tell what we're going to do. We're going to solve this for A. Right? So what do we do next? Plug in our numbers? No. Solve an algebraic equation. Divide both sides by M. M's cancel, and we get A equals minus the friction force divided by the mass. Okay? Did you guys find the answer now? Go ahead, find the answer. Then I'm gonna show you another trick. You gonna estimate it, Damon? Go ahead. Pardon? It's about four. Four? Slightly higher, slightly lower, or right on? Which way is it going to be off? A little less than negative. A little less. So, what did you get? Anybody calculate it? Negative 3.9 meters per second squared. Okay? Now, I just want to show you this because you're going to start running some problems with this. How would you guys solve this problem if I didn't give you the math? If you didn't know the mass, could you calculate the friction force? You couldn't. At least not numerically, right? So watch this. If I didn't give you the mass, you could still solve the problem. Let me back up a little bit. Right here. Algebraically, what is the friction force? Not using the numbers, but using the variables we have. The friction force is mu to k times m times g. That's the friction force. Divide it by the mass. What happens? How can you simplify it? The mass cancels. So it turns out you can find the acceleration by taking the friction coefficient times g. Do you even need the mass? Here's what it tells us. It tells us the mass doesn't matter. If the milk jug was twice as heavy, it would still have the same acceleration. But this is independent of the mass. So this is why we solve things algebraically. We learn new things. And 
If I said a milk jug is sliding, I didn't give you the math, if all you can do is numbers, you'd be stuck. You cannot solve the problem. But if you can solve it algebraically, you can keep going, and you'll realize the mass cancels. I don't need the mass. I can find the acceleration without the mass, just by applying the principle, okay? So that's kind of why I keep harping on this solve algebraically. As we get deeper and deeper into this, there's more and more problems where you just won't have enough information to calculate all the numbers. But you solve it algebraically, and it still works, okay? So this tells us the mass doesn't matter. Somebody takes half the milk out and shoves it back at you, it'll have the same acceleration, okay? All right, I want you to solve one now. So go to your notes, wherever it is, and I saved this one I just did, guys, so it's on linked on the homework. Wherever your next uh, lunch is, put problem set 2.4, 2.3. And we're gonna start with you guys solving an example. So here's my example. I'd like you to draw a free body diagram. List what you know in a variable list. And then see if you can find the force of friction and find the acceleration of the box, okay? And if you get stuck, look up here. I'll slowly unveil the solution, but I want you to try it first. And then when you get done with that, problem set 2.3 is waiting for you, okay? So see if you can work your way through this example. Talk to the person next to you if you want. They're solving the same problem. Make a free body diagram. Make a dot. Draw the forces on it. Label them. Should be four forces. Diagram, you don't have it already.
All right, so keep working on it. When you get stuck, you can check up here. But try to do it without looking. And when you finish and you feel good about it, and you get 0 0.88 meters per second squared, then go ahead and start problem set 2.3. It's waiting for you online. <laughs>